Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. And I've been looking forward to coming here and uh, sharing and indeed listening to these other men as they develop our messages uh, throughout the day. Uh, if you have your Bible with you this morning, we are going to open up in the book of 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. And uh, as you can see, our topic is Kingdom Now, Kingdom Never, or Kingdom Not Yet. And uh, I've been delegated to speak on the first of those, and that's Kingdom Now Theology. And, and uh, it's quite a big subject, really. It's a uh, If you were to develop it out to its fullest, we'd probably take up the whole day uh, discussing it theologically. But I don't intend to take up the whole day, you'll be glad to hear. Uh, But I trust at the end of this session, you'll have been helped. And that indeed, you'll maybe understand a little bit of more of the hows and the whys and the wherefores of this theological movement. And uh, also why we would reject it uh, as premillennialists. But uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, uh, beginning uh, in uh, verse 1. Or sorry, 2 Timothy. I'm, I'm, I'm teaching 2 Thessalonians at church, so I'm so used to saying that. Uh, 2 Timothy, I beg your pardon. Chapter 3 and verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Uh, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And we trust the Lord will bless the reading of his precious word. When Tony Tony Blair came to power in this country in 1997, his arrival at Downing Street was heralded by the D. Ream anthem, Things Can Only Get Better. And we all know how that ended. (laughs) Theologically, there are those who believe things can only get better. They see a world in which the cause of Christ progressively advances until at last the Lord Jesus comes and is Uh, received and crowned as king into a kingdom that has already been established by the activity of the church. In other words, the millennial kingdom occurs before the second coming. It's happening now. And the anthems of post-millennialism, I'm sure you've sung, And you've heard many of them. They're very catchy. Some of them are very well-known hymns. The Battle Hymn of the Republic. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. And the idea is that the church is advancing and the kingdom is building as each day passes. Uh, We have a story to tell to the nations. Sung in many of our churches, we have a story to tell to the nations that shall turn their hearts to the right. A story of truth and mercy, a story of peace and light. For the darkness shall turn to dawning, and the dawning to noonday bright, and Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth, the kingdom of love and light. And again, you see this idea that darkness is turning to the dawning. And you see the advancement of the gospel and the progress of the church until Christ comes uh, on earth and his kingdom comes on earth. Again, the little chorus, Majesty, penned by Jack Hayford. And he wrote these words, and these is by no means the worst of them, but but you've got to listen carefully. You know know the little chorus well, Majesty, worship his majesty. Unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, and then he writes, Kingdom Authority kingdom authority flows from his throne unto his own now that's not exactly what the bible teaches but now the church has been given the authority 
Jesus said, all power is given unto me. But now we have all power being transferred from him unto the church. And the church is now to have dominion over Satan, over sickness, over poverty, and so on. And so the chorus uh, continues. Uh, Anybody who knows me knows that if you want to see the hairs on the back of my neck raise quickly and my heckles raise, just announce that our next hymn is the days of Elijah. (laughs) These are the days of Elijah. Are they really? That puts us in tribulation. These are the days of Elijah declaring the word of the Lord. These are the days of your servant Moses. Righteousness being restored. These are the days of Ezekiel, the dry bones becoming flesh. My goodness, talk about a bad interpretation. And these are the days of your servant David, rebuilding a temple of praise. If there's coming a temple of praise, as that song suggests, it's very curious that when you get into Ezekiel 40 to 48, we have dimensions for it and we have a plan for it. Who would have thought that praise has dimensions? And if you're into contemporary Christian music and you're familiar with the songs of Rain Collective, they have a song called Build Your Kingdom, which, which goes, Unleash your kingdom's power, reaching the near and far. No force of hell can stop your beauty changing hearts. You made us for much more than this. Awake the kingdom seed in us. Fill us with the strength and love of Christ. We are your church, and listen to this last line, oh, and we are the hope of the earth. Well, we, we are looking for a blessed hope, and I'm pretty sure it's not found in us. <laughs> so all, all of this, all of these songs, all of these uh, hymns, you know, as you listen to them, and maybe you sing them, they're almost subliminally teaching your congregation post-millennialism. Now, I want to think about post-millennialism. That's what really what we're talking about this morning. We talk about kingdom now. And I want to give you a little background to post-millennial uh, thought. That's where we're going to begin. The background of post-millennial thought. Post-millennialism is the baby of the eschatological family. A premillennialism can trace its roots all the way back to the scriptures and to apostolic times. Amillennialism is rooted in Augustinian theology, but postmillennialism doesn't come along until the late 17th, early 18th century with the arrival of a man by the name of Daniel Whitby. Daniel Whitby was an Arminian uh, who later moved into Unitarianism. He's a very strange bedfellow for many of the postmillennialists today who are Calvinist uh, and uh, who would be belong to Cal- uh, covenantal churches. But nevertheless, Whitby was the one who first systemized postmillennial theology, and yet with all his ideas didn't find acceptance until the 19th century. We might call that uh, period in time the Philadelphian era of the church, when evangelicalism was making great strides in the world. It was a time of revivals, the Second Great Awakening in America, the Cornwall Revival of 1849, the Primitive Methodist Revival here in Staffordshire, the Presbyterian Revival of North Carolina, the Forfar Revival of 1857, the 1859 Ulster Revival, and of course the Welsh Revival in the early part of the 20th century. Those were the days of Charles Finney and D.L. Moody and William Booth and Joseph Parker and F.B. Mayer and Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Spurgeon was, those latter three were ministering in London. Uh, Alexander McLaren was at the uh, Union Chapel, Manchester. R.W. Deal was in Birmingham. Uh, Bonar was ministering in Edinburgh. Muller was rescuing his orphans from the streets of Bristol. Missionary movements were expanding across the globe. William Carey was in India. Hudson Taylor was in China. Adoniram Judson was in Burma. David Livingstone in America. Mary Slessor was in Nigeria. Helen Rosevear was in the Congo. Evangelicalism in this period of history was making huge strides forward all over the globe, cementing the notion that the gospel was conquering the world in advance of the coming of the Lord. Things 
could only get better. And we can see why in that period of time, post-millennialism appealed to congregations of that uh, day. And post-millennialism was given a fresh hearing and a new impetus. But then came along World War One. Of course, that was the war to end all wars. And we all know there hasn't been a war since. Until World War II came along. And suddenly the world was not such a happy place. The optimism of the late 19th, early 20th century suffered a setback. And it gave way to the death and horror of life in a uh, society or in a world which was seeing global conflict. And uh, as a consequence, uh, we, we saw also the beginning of the decline of evangelical influence. Postmillennialism almost died out. By this stage, and certainly by the middle of the 20th century, it had but a handful of advocates, so much so that Lewis Berry Schaeffer said of it in 1936 that it was without living voice. And Walford it's writing in 1959 said, it's fair to say that post-millennialism is not a current issue in theology. But fast forward to the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century, and what do we find? There is a resurgence in post-millennial thought. And this resurgence began with a man by the name of Rusus J. Rushdoni, an American Calvinist, a philosopher, a historian, a theologian. And Rushdoni, Rushdoni became the uh, father of the so-called Christian Reconstructionism, of which p- post-millennial thought is the central plank. In 1973, he proposed that the Old Testament law should be applied to modern society and that there should be a Christian theonomy, uh, carrying the idea that society should be reconstructed according to the law of God as preached in the gospel and the Great Commission. And so the the last 40 years or so particularly have witnessed a resurgence in post-millennial thinking. And you might say, well, how so? What happened in that period of time that really fed into this idea that the church is establishing the kingdom in advance of Christ's appearing. Well, in the 1980s, there was a rise in what the BBC now likes to call the evangelical right wing of America. And uh, that was the time, if you were around at that time, you'll remember Jerry Falwell and his moral majority, uh, a political movement, somewhat religious political movement. He and uh, Pat Robertson also formed the Christian Coalition uh, of America. And they campaigned in the United States uh, for politically conservative candidates. And the decline of morality uh, within society was seen as, in part, as stemming uh, from ungodly legislation. Let me tell you something. You can never legislate for righteousness, true righteousness. There's not a law you can bring in that's going to change the heart of men. You know, if you wanted a, a scriptural uh, verification of that, look no further than the revolt at the end of the millennial kingdom. You know, man will have enjoyed a thousand years of a perfect society with the perfect government, with perfect education. Nobody's starving. Nobody's going poor. You get to the end of the millennial kingdom and what? There's a revolt against the rule of Christ. Even though there are perfect laws, even though the law of God is what's governing the earth. But nevertheless, this was the idea that Ungodly legislation was part of the issue. And so uh, concerned with electing righteous rulers and living in a righteous nation, the so-called evangelical right had a significant impact on the political landscape of the United States and uh, to the point that the Republican Party in America is also almost now viewed as the political wing of the evangelical church, which is a grave mistake on the part of the church. So you have Reconstructionism. And Reconstructionism appeals uh, for uh, Christians to, uh, who yearn uh, for a change in the world around them. It appeals to them and they're encouraged to 
infiltrate all the various strata of society, the media, the education system, political system, government, and so on. And the idea is if we can if we can get in there and we can exercise our influence, we can turn the whole society toward God and godliness, toward a more righteous society, and indeed, ultimately, we can usher in the kingdom of God. Some of the best-known Reconstructionist thinkers include the late Greg Banson, the late Gary North, uh, he was Rush Dooney's son-in-law, Kenneth Gentry. Uh, some of you will be familiar with James White, the apologist, the Christian apologist, very well known. Uh, also uh, made a switch to post-millennial thinking just two or three years ago. You know, it's interesting, he began life as a dispensational premillennialist, And then by his own confession, he became a pan-millennialist meaning it'll all pan out in the end. Uh, and then he adopted amillennialism, and now he's moved to postmillennialism. There's a man who knows how to stick his ground, isn't he? Huh? And when you move from amillennialism to postmillennialism, well, that's an easy switch to make because both systems involve replacement uh, theology, both replace uh, Israel with the church, and both see the kingdom of Christ in some form prior to his coming. Then also in the early 1980s, you had a rise in what is termed third wave Pentecostalism. Uh, this is part and parcel of the evolution of the Pentecostal movement of the 1960s. The first wave of Pentecostals, of course, was in the early part of the 20th century uh, at Azusa Street, the so-called revival there and the birth of uh, Pentecostalism. And many classical Pentecostal denominations came out of that movement, such as the Assemblies of God. The second wave occurred in the 1960s where Pentecostalism moved into mainstream denominations. And you began to see uh, some of the, the mainstream churches uh, beginning to practice uh, the, the so-called gifts and so on. And then the third wave came along in the shape of John Wimber and the Vineyard Movement. And within this movement was the viewpoint that God had called believers to take dominion. And really this goes back to the earliest chapter of Genesis where man is told to have dominion over the earth. And so the idea was that we had to take dominion. We have to capture the earth uh, on behalf of God. And so uh, dominion theology arose, uh, teaching that although Satan uh, had been in control of the world since the fall, God was looking for people who would help him take back dominion. And when I see that, I think, poor God. Poor God that he needs our help with this. And the idea is we've got to take back dominion, restore the kingdom, and when the kingdom is complete, then Jesus simply comes in and takes up his throne, thankful to us for all the good work we have done on his behalf. To quote Pat Robertson, Now what do you do? What do I do? What do all of us do? We get ready to take dominion. It's all going to be ours. I'm talking about all of it. Everything that you would say is a good part of the secular world, every means of communication, the news, the television, the radio, the cinema, the arts, the government, the finance, it's going to be ours. And so they deliberately rejected the belief in Christ's premillennial return, which was really something that many of the early Pentecostal folks held to. They rejected the idea of Christ's premillennial turn, return, and they say, well, it was just, it was useful up to that point in time. Friends, what way is that to handle theology? What kind of pragmatic outlook is that? Well, that serves our purpose to this point. Now we'll change our theology because we've got a different purpose. So they said it was useful up to that period uh, in time, but basically it had run its course and was in reality a false hope. In the words of one of their proponents, Newport, he said, we are entering into the kingdom age in a sense now, for the kingdom is being formed in us. And when it is completed, all judicial as well as religious authority will be fested in the church of Christ. Now you think about what he's saying there. All judicial and religious authority is fested in the church of Christ. If I read my Bible, God the Father committed all judgment to God the Son, and God the Son has not relinquished that judgment in favor of the church of Christ. 
Paul tells the church that every one of us shall give an account of himself unto God. He tells us we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So now many charismatic folks claim kingdom authority and dominion over Satan, over sickness, over poverty. And they see themselves as claiming the kingdom of Christ. And hence you have this idea, which is really endemic in many parts of the church, the idea of prayer walks and prayer marches and so-called witness marches, all of them rooted in this notion that we are capturing territory. You see, it's not just about prayer. Nobody's, Nobody's against prayer. But this is about capturing territory, taking back chunks of land that Satan has control of in order to give them back to Christ when he eventually appears as the kingdom is ultimately established. When we built our church at Milton, um, there was a lady who attended Bless Her. She was a lovely lady, and she came in the early days after we built the church. She didn't stay very long, but she came and uh, she came to me one day and, and she said, uh, you know, when you were building this building, she says, did you check the ground? And I says, what do you mean? She says, well, before you built this building, there was a row of houses on here. And she says, dear knows what was happening in those houses. Anything could have been going on in those houses. Uh, did, you, did you think to check the ground, to examine the ground? And I said, oh yes, I says, we paid 10,000 pounds and a civil engineer came out and he dug a 100 foot foot deep hole and he's given me a big report like that and he says, there's nothing wrong with the ground. She says, no, no, that's not what I mean. She says, there could be demons in this ground. In other words, she wanted to know if we had reclaimed this territory for Christ, this territory that supposedly previously belonged to the devil. What's the Bible say? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the people and all they that dwell therein. But under this system of thought, the earth is the devil's. And this has now developed into a fourth wave of charismatic teaching which teaches the church was obligated to establish the kingdom of God on earth uh, but the cause of failure was the fact that we had lost our apostolic and prophetic ministry early on and so in these last days we have to restore the position of the apostles and the prophets and you now have the uh, so-called new apostolic reformation now they're very different the, 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 the charismatic stream of post-millennialism is very different from the reconstructionist uh, stream of, of uh, post-millennialism. Uh, but both of them believe similarly in this respect. They both believe there must be a worldwide revival before the return of Christ. Before Christ can come, there has to be a worldwide revival. And the reasoning is that God will not allow his church to be swamped by sin or the forces of the evil one, but rather in the last days his people will become prosperous and they shall become victorious over their enemies. Now that's the background. Let's think about the basis though of premillennial thought. Uh, One of the great theologians who, uh, who really helped understand post-millennialism and he himself being a post-millennialist, Lorian Botner, uh, says this, and he defines post-millennialism this way. He says, it's that view of the last things which holds that the kingdom of God is now being extended in the world through the preaching of the gospel and the saving work of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of individuals. That the world eventually is, and this is a term post-millennialists use and bandy about regularly, the world eventually is to be Christianized. I'm not quite sure what that means. Christianized. And that the return of Christ is to occur at the close of a long period of righteousness and peace, commonly called the millennium. The millennium to which the post-millennialist looks forward is thus a golden age of spiritual prosperity during this present dispensation, that is, during the church age, and is to be brought about through forces now active in the world. It is an indefinitely long period of time, perhaps much longer than a literal 1,000 years. The changed character of individuals will be reflected in an uplifted social, economic, political, and cultural life of mankind. Evil... In all its many forms 
Eventually, you've got to love this line, eventually will be reduced to negligible proportions. The Christian principles will be the rule, not the exception, and that Christ will return to a truly Christianized world. Now, that's as good a definition of kingdom now theology, post-millennialism, as you could possibly come by. So in post-millennialism, the kingdom of God is primarily the rule and reign of God spiritually in and over the hearts of men. Now, going back to the time of Daniel Whitby, some of them held at that time that it would be a 1,000-year literal kingdom, and indeed it would lead up, you can you know, you count your way through it, so to speak, until Christ would return. Uh, but today, most part, modern post-millennialists uh, take it as, a, as an indefinable number of years, as we just read. They don't limit it to 1,000 years. They basically go back to Pentecost, uh, or even to the time of Christ, and they say all of this is the kingdom age all of it is building until finally the world is conquered and then Jesus comes and we receive him as our king. In other words, the kingdom arrives and is present wherever and whenever people believe the gospel and commit themselves to the sovereignty of Jesus Christ as Lord. So the, king is not, the kingdom is not seen as we would see it as coming instantaneously with the king. It's not something that is seen as coming when Christ appears, but something that comes gradually and by degrees over the course of church history. The means by which the kingdom comes is through the uh, extension of the gospel itself. According to one advocate, Doug Wilson, he said the gospel will continue to grow and flourish throughout the world. More and more individuals will be converted. We're finding that, aren't we? The nations will stream to Christ, as you see every night on the BBC. And the Great Commission will finally be successfully completed. The earth will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. When that happens, genera generation after generation will love and serve the Lord faithfully. And then the end will come. Bonson said this. The thing that distinguishes the biblical postmillennialist, there's a misnomer, the thing that distinguishes the biblical postmillennialist then from amillennialists and premillennialists is his belief that the scripture teaches the success of the Great Commission in this age of the church. Gentry said, the overwhelming majority of men and uh, nations will be Christianized, righteousness will abound, wars will cease, and prosperity and safety will flourish. And Butler said, we can look forward, this is cheery, we can look forward to a great golden age of spiritual prosperity continuing for centuries or even for millenniums, during which time Christianity will be triumphant over all the earth. Now it's true to say that every theological position, no matter what it is, usually has its proof text. And post-millennialism is no different. But the thing that strikes me as I, as I was looking through this and preparing for this message this morning, the thing that struck me was that their proof texts are largely Old Testament proof texts. Psalm 2, Isaiah 9, Psalm 110, verse 1. And, uh, you know, there, there was very little New Testament support offered in favor of post-millennial uh, thinking. Uh, primarily, uh, their, their key uh, New Testament text is uh, Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 uh, to 33, uh, where you read about the parable of the mustard seed. And uh, you might want to look that up with me for a moment, Matthew chapter 13 uh, and verse 31. Of course, these are the kingdom parables. Um, and this, this particular view of the parable of the mustard seed isn't by any means exclusive to post-millennialism, uh, but certainly it is one of their proof texts. In chapter 13, verse 31, uh, the Lord says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Now, if you understand this, uh, this particular parable, we know that the sower is the, the Lord himself. 
Uh, but in this, in this instance, the postmillennialist takes the mustard seed to represent the gospel, starting from very small beginnings, but growing to reach millions throughout the world. Uh, eventually, it becomes a kingdom. It becomes a tree. Uh, the tree is rooted in Christ. It has grown a harvest far beyond its initial planting. And then the birds of the air are those who follow Jesus, and the tree offers refuge uh, in him uh, and uh, offers refuge for his faithful to rest in him. There's a number of problems with this, and really we don't have time to, to go into it in any great deal. But let me just say to you that, that in this instance, there's a strange thing happens. A herb becomes a tree. In other words, it changes completely in character. And actually, if you, again, we don't have time to get into it, but if you were to get into it, you'd find that birds are not associated with faithful believers. Faithful believers are referred to as sheep. Birds represent that which is demonic. And so what you're seeing here is the, is the growth of Christendom and its infection by the demonic. Yet with all that is the, new, the key New Testament text that is offered in favor of postmillennialism. Now I want to just close by thinking about the Bible and postmillennial thought. Postmillennialism has two major problems. Here they are. Number one, Revelation. And number two is reality. Those two actually mitigate any possi- against any possibility that postmillennialism has substance or is a truth. And let's begin with Revelation. There's a good reason why postmillennialists focus on Old Testament texts rather than New Testament texts. You see, it's very easy to go into the Old Testament and make a text apply to your theology. The Jehovah's Witnesses do that all the time, do they not? You know, they come to your door, very rarely are they in the New Testament, very often they're in the Old Testament. Because they know most people are not familiar with the Old Testament, most people don't have background in the Old Testament, most people don't understand the history of the Old Testament, and so consequently they take texts out of their context, they make a pretext, and they say what they want the Old Testament to say. And post-millennialism does much the same thing. It takes these Old Testament texts Uh, which are often more obscure, often more vulnerable to poor interpretation, in contrast to the clear New Testament text dealing dealing with the end times. Now, my question this morning is this, and this is where we're going to close out, and we're just going to look at a, a chain of passages, but does the New Testament herald a golden age before Christ's coming? Does the New Testament teach that the millennial kingdom will be established, that we'll be living in a society that is uplifted in terms of its education, its economy, its health, and so forth, just prior to the coming of the Lord, and Jesus simply has to come and seal the deal and take up his throne. Well, what did our opening text say in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy? It says, This know also that in the last days, Perilous times shall come. Now look, there's nothing obscure about that. There's nothing ambiguous about that. You don't have to be a genius to understand that sentence. It says in the last days, perilous times shall come. And the word perilous means dangerous times, troublesome times, at times characterized by the ferocity of sinful human nature. It speaks of a savage society. And I would say we're living in a savage society today. And when you continue on that particular text, it details the kind of society that is in view. It says, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. It's all about me. Covetous, boasters. Proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. 
Does that sound like a golden age to you? Later in the passage, Paul writes, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. He doesn't say it's going to get better and better. I mean, if everybody had an opportunity to say it's going to get better, surely it's in that particular chapter. Surely after listing all of those characteristics of the last generation, he would have said, but cheer up, folks. That's not the end. Things are going to get better and better. But having listed all of those different kinds of people and their qualities or lack thereof, he says it's going to get worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, that sounds like a very strange form of revival to me. The Lord Jesus Christ himself described the days prior to his coming as being like the days of Noah and the days of Lot in Luke chapter 17. Let's look there. The Gospel of Luke chapter 17. Chapter 17 of Luke, verse 26, he says, and this is our Savior speaking, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Uh, according to our friends in postmillennialism, uh, when the Son of Man is revealed, the world should be Christianized. But Jesus says, no, it's going to be as the days of Noah. The days of Noah were not days of revival. They weren't days of righteousness being restored. They were days of extreme violence. They were days of evil imaginations. Uh, they were days not unlike this present day in which we live. The days of Lot were not days characterized by spiritual victory in the city of Sodom. But they were days of great uh, growing affluence, of great pride, and of course deep sexual sin, including sexual violence and homosexuality, and pedophilia, even rape. If you go back there and read in Genesis 19, all those things are present. All of them. Are these the days of Lot? My friends, you only have to look back to last weekend. Our Queen's Platinum Jubilee. Saturday night, they had drag queens coming out, dancing on a catwalk. The next, on, on Sunday, they had a pageant in which a whole section was devoted to gay pride. And I'm quite sure the queen didn't approve any of that. These are the days of Lot, not the days of Elijah. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul's great eschatological epistle, he speaks of the future coming man of sin. But he reminds us in verse 7 of that chapter that the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth uh, will let her. He who now restrains uh, will restrain until he be taken out of the way, referencing the Holy Spirit. He says the mystery of iniquity is already at work. And he says, and so it would continue if it were not for the fact that the Holy Spirit is restraining him. The man of sin would be revealed. But there's coming a day when the Holy Spirit will step aside. He'll be taken out of the way and the man of sin will be revealed. Again, Paul, if you look in 1 Timothy chapter 4, he speaks of the latter days as, as times of immense spiritual deception and great apostasy. 1 Timothy chapter 4. And notice the, notice the careful wording of the Holy Spirit as he inspires this passage. He says, Now the Spirit speaketh, notice this word. If you're using the authorized version, it's a great word. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. In other words, there's, 
There's no doubt about this. Now this is not something that's up for debate. This is not something we might question. No, the Spirit speaketh expressly, categorically, without danger of contradiction, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Now what is postmillennialism telling us? In the latter times millions shall come to the faith. It's exactly the opposite. Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. How interesting there is that Paul begins to uh, expand on his thoughts. He speaks about the uh, war against marriage. It's interesting that we're living a day in which marriage is devalued. And marriage is demeaned. And not only that, he speaks about those who abstain from meats. Friends, if you haven't heard by now, you need to stop eating meat. Otherwise, we'll not be able to save the planet. You realize this? The problem all along has been cow gas. Let me help you out here. That's the problem. It's not sin. Sin's not the problem. Cow gas is the problem. Stop eating hamburgers. You're killing us. Abstaining from meats. People take this seriously. Our young people are are suffering climate anxiety. Many of them are turning to vegetarianism and veganism. Now look, if you don't want to eat meat because you don't like meat, that's fine. I don't care. But if you don't want to eat meat because you think that you're saving the planet, you're being deceived. You're being deceived. And again, there's no signs of revival here. No sense that things are going to get Better, you know, it's just going to get worse and worse. In Second Timothy chapter 4, at the end of uh, that epistle, uh, Paul says this in verses 3 and 4, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. What kind of teachers? What kind of teachers appeal to your lusts? The kind of teacher who tells you that God wants you rich. That God wants you to own a beachfront home on the shore, just like Jesus had at Galilee. (laughs) Everybody knows that Jesus had a beachfront home at Galilee. That appeals to your lusts. says that men will put themselves, they'll no longer endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned onto fables. And let me be honest with you this morning. Most of the church on Sunday is served a diet of fables in this country. Not the word of truth. Entirely in keeping with that, Paul Peter Peter writes a complimentary passage in Second Peter chapter three. He says this, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, 
Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Listen, friends, Peter did not envisage Christ returning to a believing world. He envisaged Christ returning to a scoffing world. John says, and we know that we are of God. And the whole world lieth in wickedness. And Jude quotes Enoch. And he says, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. And he says, He comes to be received into a Christianized world where everybody is dancing across the daisies in the fields and singing happily and shouting wonderfully. These are the days of Elijah. These are the days, Lord, we've built you a temple of praise. And Jesus, that's not what Jude wrote. Jude wrote, he comes with his church to execute judgment upon all. And to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed. In case you didn't catch it three times, Jude says it's ungodly at the end. You can see why the post-millennialist doesn't want you in the New Testament, can't you? You can see why he's taking you into the Old Testament. Three times he speaks of ungodliness. Coming to convince all their ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed. Of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. There's a fourth time. These are murmurers, complainers, walking again after their own lusts. And their mouth speaketh great swelling words. Having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. This is hardly the Christianized world envisaged by post-millennialists. It's not a world dominated by the gospel. It's not a world in which a government has been reconstructed in keeping with Old Testament law, with a church resplendent in victory, awaiting its Messiah's arrival. It's a world that's opposed to Christ. And that is exactly what you find when you open to the book of Revelation. For as wave after wave of God's judgment falls upon those who are on the earth during that tribulation period, we find that men are not repentant and believing, but we find that they are defiant and blasphemous. They cry, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. They're not going out there to greet the Lord. They're not saying, oh, look, the Lord is coming. They're saying, hide us from him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of of the Lamb. That's a strange thing for a Christianized world to say. Three times in Revelation 16, as the bold judgments are poured out, we read of their blasphemy. It says in, in verse 9, and men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God. Verse 11, and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. Uh, Verse 21 of that chapter, and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of hail. Which explains why it is, friends, that when the Lord comes in his second coming, in his revelation, quite separate from the rapture, the rapture he comes for the church, In Revelation, he comes with the church. In rapture, he comes to the air. In Revelation, he comes to the earth. When he comes in Revelation, the second time to the earth, he's not coming as a happy Jesus ready to receive his throne, but as one who in righteousness judges and what makes war. To say the kingdom is now increasing every day until ultimately the darkness shall turn to the dawning and the dawning to noonday bright and Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth is to defy the clear revelation of God. We sang that at Milton. I changed the words. I took the diabolical liberty of changing the words that the hymn writer wrote and we didn't sing Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth. We sang Christ's great kingdom shall come to earth. 
Quite a different thing, isn't it? I don't know what the pastor that followed me did. <laughs> Where is he? There he is. He's a great fellow. <laughs> but anyway, that's what we used to sing. So it's not, it's clearly, you know, you go into the New Testament, it's clearly, as, as clear as your nose is in your face, a denial of everything the New Testament teaches about the end times. But it's also a denial of reality. I mean, admittedly, we don't know that it's quite possible that history could turn in favor of the gospel, in favor of the church, as it's done in past seasons. But realistically, that's not how it's looking at all, is it? <clears throat> Evil men are waxing worse and worse. You know, we've got, a, we, we've got a government and a prime minister who simply doesn't know how to tell the truth. You know, I was teaching our young, our children last Sunday morning at Points Past Baptist Church. I was teaching them that, you know, how a lie can keep you out of heaven. And I started the children's talk with a picture of Pinocchio. And I asked them if they knew the story of Pinocchio, and they all said they did. And I asked them what it was, and they said, well, when he lied, his, his nose grew long. I said, it's a good thing that isn't true. Otherwise, our prime minister would never get out the door in the morning. <laughs> Man doesn't know the truth. And yet, who voted him into power? We did. Our society did. And if you think choosing the other side will be any better, <laughs> think again. And it's the same all over the world. It's not just a British problem. It's a global problem. And so we find that you know, society is in terminal decline. We, we're now living in a constant threat, under a constant threat of global terrorism. Our children are not safe to walk the streets or play on the streets or even go to school. You know, in, in, in my day, every kid walked to school. You walked there, you walked back, nobody bothered you. My goodness, my parents are almost driving them to the door of the classroom. And it's not, you know, people of my generation some can, sometimes condemn that as luxury and, and, and as a result of affluence. Actually, I think it's a result of fear. They're afraid to let their children walk a mile to school. Perversion is celebrated the world throughout. All kinds of perversion. And everything that Jesus said would happen is happening. Wars and disease and famine and natural disaster. And we haven't even begun to see the worst of it yet. The worst of all of that will come in the tribulation period. Friends, whatever else we might say about the kingdom of Christ, we can say this with absolute certainty. It's surely not now. I mean, we could take the time, and maybe some of the other speakers will, and look at the characteristics of the kingdom. And you'd see it just doesn't marry up. It just doesn't marry up. Nothing that is experienced in this world around us, or has ever been experienced in this world around us, would give us any indication that the conditions of the kingdom are being fulfilled. Postmillennialism is patently mistaken. Things are not getting better. They're getting worse day by day. Now I can hear our post-millennial post friends saying, oh, there they go. How pessimistic are those pre-millennialists? That's what they say. They say we're pessimists. They will argue that their model is far more upbeat, far more hopeful. It gives more impetus to evangelism. They see the church triumphant and the gospel victorious. But again, this is a denial of revelation and reality. The church has failed. We have failed in our obedience to the Great Commission. But in the face of our faithfulness, one will appear someday who is faithful and true. That's his name. And his appearance is our blessed hope. My hope, and forgive me friends, I don't mean to be in any way insulting, but my hope is not in you folks that are gathered here today. 
And my hope is not in my congregation or any other congregation. My hope is in the Lord. He is coming. And there is nothing pessimistic or negative in waiting and looking for him. May God bless these thoughts to your hearts this morning.